Thank you for joining the Reti BBL webinar. I'm Mark Sabri, Director of International Coordination Reti, and I will be serving as the moderator. Today, we are truly honored to welcome uh, Dr. Muhe uh, Adai uh, McGowan, Deputy Head of Division, Senior Economist, Country Studies, Desk, uh, Japan, and Ireland, Economic Department, OECD. And uh, Mr. K. Oguro, Economist, Economics Department, OECD. They will give us a lecture on confronting the crisis, OECD Economic Outlook, November 2022. First, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Uh, Naoko Ueda, a new head of OECD Tokyo Center. Ms. Ueda, uh, please introduce yourself and today's event. Thank you very much, uh, Mark Sabuli-san, and warm greetings to all who are watching this. On behalf of the OECD Tokyo Center, where I serve as new head since this summer, I would like to express a sincere gratitude to the Rieti for your kind organization of this BBL. This is an auspicious event, and I hope to have many more collaboration in future to make the OECD's work better known and leveraged by a wide range of stakeholders in Japan and in the region. Today, Dr. Muge Adlet Magua and Mr. K. Ogro from the OECD Economic Department will give us presentations which will help us better understand the key messages of the OECD's latest economic outlook just recently published on 22nd of November. The outlook talks about the massive and historic energy shock triggered by Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, states the global economy is facing serious headwinds and calls for an end to the war and a just peace for Ukraine, which will be the most impactful way to improve the global economic outlook. Against this backdrop, the outlook also lays out a series of policy actions that governments should take to confront the crisis. While this outlook is about global economy, we are fortunate to have a presentation on Japan Country Note 2. I join you all to listen to Dr. McGowan and Mr. Ogro for their sharp presentation with great interest. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ueda san. Now we'd like to uh, listen to uh, Dr. Makugawan and uh, Mr. Oguro's presentation. Uh, Dr. Makugawan, would you start your presentation? So um, I'd like to thank you uh, for inviting us to present the OECD Global Outlook that was released uh, last week. Uh, this outlook is dominated by uh, the third major shock hitting, hitting the world economy in the past 15 years. It's the largest we have seen since the 1970s energy crisis. So this chart uh, illustrates this fact uh, quite well. What we see is how large the shock is. So energy expenditures have risen sharply in OECD economies to around 18% of GDP, levels that we haven't seen, seen since the late 1970s or early 1980s. So when energy prices increase, energy expenditures tend to increase which cuts off other kinds of spending, which in turn creates the risk of widespread recession across OECD countries over the coming months. And this energy shock has spread into broader prices. So here we see that the share of items in the inflation basket with price increases above 6% is two to three times higher than a year ago in, in most large OECD countries. So the Jap situation in Japan is relatively good in international perspective, but the change from last year is still not insignificant. So higher prices are uh, bad for the economy because they weigh on purchasing power and confidence. We see that OECD confidence, average confidence levels are lower than what they were in, in 2008 and 2020. And this is especially the case in Europe. However, at the same time, we see that labor markets are, uh, have continued to remain tight across the OECD. So compared to the five-year average 2014 to 2019, the white dots, the ratio of job, job vacancies per unemployed um, has increased in all countries in this figure. It's especially tight in the US where the vacancies per unemployed is around two. So um, such work, worker shortages increase the 
risk of um, large wage rises, which can in turn fuel inflation further. Uh, so this chart is probably the most striking chart and the most me important message of uh, this outlook. Uh, even though labor markets are remaining very tight, nominal wage increases have not kept up with, with the unanticipated, very sudden and large increase in, in increases in inflation and real wages have fallen in almost all, all OECD countries. Uh, in the, here we see the third quarter of 2022, our latest data. So there is a lot of cross-country variation. So in Japan, it's less than 2%. But then on the other hand, we see in the Czech Republic, it's uh, almost 10%. So such a, large and such a large decline in purchasing power can be a serious drag on consumption and growth. So here we you see our latest projections. We now project global growth to be 3.1% in 2022, slow to 2.2% in 2023, before bouncing back to a relatively modest level of 2.7% in 2024. So we expect global growth to be driven by Asia. So the blue bars in this, uh, in this figure. So emerging a Asia will be the main engine of growth in 2023 and 2024. So they account for close to three fourths of global GDP growth in 2023, for example. So the green bars you can see is quite small. So Europe is particularly affected by the impact of Russia's war against Ukraine and high energy prices, which are we assume to persist throughout the projection period. So in this table, you see our real GDP growth projections for G20 economies. I guess the most striking is uh, the red downwards arrows that you see for 2023 for almost all countries. So uh, that means that we have revised our growth outlook for, um, for most major economies uh, in the OECD. And they, this is because the uncertainty is very high. So downside risks have, um, have intensified resulting in these downward revisions for almost G20 all G20 countries. So as you can see, Japan projections are flat. So Kay will talk about this uh, after, after me when we focus more specifically on Japan. Here we see our inflation projections and we expect inflation to remain high this year and next given the impact of the war on energy and food markets, but eventually moderate in 2024. So average OECD inflation, the blue bar, will reach 9% in 2022, and then declining but remaining relatively high in 2023, the green bar, 6.6%, and then to 5.1% in 2024. As tighter monetary policy takes effect, demand pressures decrease, and transport costs and delivery times normalize, although the pace of decline will vary across, uh, across countries. So let me now turn to risks. Uh, the most important uh, risk in the outlook is the gas supply shortages in Europe this winter and next and higher prices globally for energy. So energy uh, prices paid by households and firms may increase further. This we illustrate by this slide, which shows the energy prices paid by households and firms uh, uh, and showing wholesale versus retail prices. So European households are paying more than ever for their electricity and natural gas, even as governments are providing a lot of fiscal support to shield consumers from the energy crisis. So the risk we see is that um, there might be further short-term pressures in energy-related retail inflation. So, so far, the rise in retail energy prices, the blue bars, has only risen by a fraction of what has been happening in wholesale markets, the red bars. So if there is further pass through uh, from wholesale to retail prices, that's an important risk. Uh, so not only households are affected, of course, firms might also be affected. So uh, the risk of bankruptcy, production declines is also growing. So these firms will need to adjust that there might be a permanent element to the inflation risks that we are seeing. 
So going back, uh, other risks is of course, supply chain bottlenecks we've seen have been easing, but they have not disappeared. The risks are still there. Uh, and then there is also monetary policy tightening in response to the uh, high inflation. But these high inflation also puts households, firms and countries are under pressure. So for households with variable rate mortgages, they're facing rising interest pay payments. Firms are uh, facing tighter credit conditions. And also many low income countries are at high risk of debt distress. So past experience shows that when advanced economies um, tighten their monetary policy rate, there can be significant negative spillovers to emerging market economies. And finally, given the impact on food prices, food insec insecurity is also a key vulnerability. So pre-war Ukraine supplied uh, a significant share of wheat imports and also energy prices inc price increases are increasing the price of fertilizers which is pushing food costs up. So uh, what can we do? <laughs> Turning to policies. So the main message is that monetary policy should continue to tighten in countries where inflation remains high and broad-based. So as we saw above, the real, uh, real wages are falling in many countries. So this is hurting people. So fighting inflation has to be our top priority. This is why central banks around the world are increasing interest rates to slow demand growth and hence uh, prices. Uh, again, uh, <laughs> Japan is, a, is an outlier in this case. What about fiscal policy? So fiscal policy should work together with monetary policy, so they shouldn't contradict each other. If we, if we have fiscal stimulus, it can raise demand pressures that monetary policy is trying to address. So this would result in even higher interest rates needed to increase it to control inflation, which would add to financial vulnerabilities. This means that fiscal policies, policies to shield households and firms from the energy shock must be targeted and temporary because we don't want to add to the inflationary pressures and increase public debt burdens. So however, so far, as you can see from uh, this chart, on the right hand side, this support is mostly untargeted across the OECD. So price caps and price and income subsidies and reduced taxes are all being used by uh, almost all OECD countries. So this was an effective and administratively simple short term policy. However, as energy prices are likely to remain high and volatile for some time, untargeted measures to keep prices down will likely become increasingly difficult to fund and can discourage energy savings and should be avoided. Um, so we, we talk about monetary and fiscal policy, macroeconomic policies are important. Well, of, of course, OECD is uh, known for structural policies. So we want to talk about some structural policies uh, as well that can help address uh, this important shock. So, the left-hand side uh, uh, chart is a IEA hypothetical situation of how the Euro how Europe can manage um, the energy crisis and uh, encourage energy security over the winter. Winter, so the blue bar is the uh, the Russian pipeline gas supply that would need to be replaced. Uh, so it requires a combination of policies to replace it. So there can be energy savings, the purple bar, supply diversification, the red bar, um, other pipeline gas, uh, gas uh, options, the orange line. So governments in Europe have made good progress for this, for this winter, but also there is the next winter, which might be difficult. So diversifying supply should also mean boosting reliable and low emission generation. So this is the key to reducing vulnerability to unreliable fossil fuel exporters and therefore increasing energy security. So you can see in the right-hand side figure, this is a very substantial challenge, uh, a challenge for the world. So a huge investment in clean energy is essential to reduce the risks of future price hikes and volatility and get on track for net zero emissions by 2050. 
So of course, governments should take the lead and provide strategic orientation, uh, but the investment required is too large for public finances. So what the governments also need to do is provide transparent, clear messages, investment um, certainty, so that private investors know what to do and can invest as well. So uh, the second important structural message is that we have to keep markets open to help restore growth. So international trade should continue to flow to strengthen competitive pressures and help alleviate supply constraints. So the left-hand side shows that bottlenecks that global value chains have been con confronting are showing improvement. So shipping costs have declined. But the right hand chart shows that risks are still there. So it, this is a OECD uh, simulation. It's, it's a warning against falling into protectionism. It shows uh, that our, according to our simulations, the effects on GDP of a significant increase in trade investment could be rather large. Uh, so we talked about tight labor markets at the beginning of the presentation, but across the OECD, there are still large gaps between female and male employment rates. So these gender gaps not only increase inequality, but also decrease labor supply at a time when we need more labor. So increased support for childcare, providing for flexible work hours can help women with children to return to the workhorse and boost growth. And finally, we want to stress the importance of uh, restoring potential growth through investing in skills. So during the pandemic, there was a big, set, a big setback in human capital accumulation because people, uh, young workers couldn't uh, experience hands-on work experience. Uh, school age children couldn't go to school. So here we see that across the OECD on average, schools were closed for 13 weeks fully and then uh, and an additional 24 weeks partially which corresponds to almost uh, one school one whole school year so again um, here japan uh, performed uh, well in retrospect in respect to other oecd countries but across the oecd there is a need to uh, reap these losses back so in like extra uh, apprenticeship training and investing in skills is needed. So finally, as I finish the global part of the presentation, these are our policy messages. And uh, what, what we want to stress is that we need macroeconomic policies and structural policies to fight this uh, inflation wave that was unleashed on the world economy by the Russia's war in Ukraine. Thank you. So now I'd like to talk about the Japan's economic situation. So Japan struggled to recover in 2020 and 2021. The first impact of COVID-19 was relatively weak compared with other OECD countries, but economic rebound was also relatively small. And uh, its recovery, especially private consumption investment recovery, were depressed by a series of sanitary shock and a step and go confinement measures. However, in 2022, Japan balanced sanitary measures and socioeconomic activities. Then Japan recorded positive growth continuously. Under the sixth wave of COVID-19 early in this year, the confined measures did not harm economic activity severely. The seventh wave in this uh, summer recorded the highest number of infection and deaths, but the government did not introduce any confined measures. So the latest uh, negative growth uh, was mainly by one of effect of service import. Then the Japan's do domestic demand growth uh, uh, is firm also in this last quarter. So now I'd like to talk about inflation. So Japan's inflation rate was led by energy and food. Uh, and the oil price kept subsidy since early this year. So the energy uh, price hike has led by electricity and uh, city gas mainly. And uh, many food and beverage product prices, including dining out service have increased recently. 
as raw material price hike and confined measures eased. The food price increased was remarkably, especially in October. Another leading factor is communication price. After the expiry of the effect of the mobile phone fee cut last year, a price hike of mobile phone device due to yen depreciation, yen depreciation also pushed up the index. Travel subsidy resumed uh, from October, depressed the headline inflation around 0.1 to 0.2 percent point. Labor market has been tightening, but wage growth remains sluggish. In addition to policy effect, weak wage pressure and cost pass through make Japan's inflation relatively low compared with other advanced economy. While domestic demand is recovering slowly but steadily, external demand has been volatile. Supply chain disruption by Russian war and China's zero COVID policies have made, held back production investment export. Furthermore, widening policy interest rate differentials with other advanced economies have led the additional yen depreciation, the adding upward pressure on the prices. The currency Currency depreciation increased export volume and import price in general. Uh, with the high energy price, recent currency depreciation increased the trade deficit. It also decreased the corporate profit for farms depending on imports. But uh, on the other hand, they increased the profit to exporting farms. Next, I would like to talk about our assumption and outlook. Labor market continue to continue tightening and the unemployment rate will continue to fall. Wage growth will be lagged in short term but gain momentum later. In terms of cons consumer price, global energy price will continue to rise until early 2023 because of EU's oil embargo from Russia and remain constant thereafter. The exchange rate is kept constant throughout the projection period. The energy subsidy will continue but gradually decline in 2024. As output gap closes and growth, uh, wage growth gain momentum, inflation is projected to increase to the 2%, the Bank of Japan's target, at the end of 2024. For fiscal policy, we include the new economic policy package uh, decided on October 28th and related supplementary budget uh, amounted around uh, 30 trillion Japanese yen. However, we assume that R&D and investment subsidy will be implemented in multiple years. Then its push up effect is diluted, but expanded several years. As you can see in the left figure, upward revision from previous outlook comes mainly from the package effect. I'm sorry, this previous uh, uh, projection is the September and uh, interim economic outlook. So, and then, <clears throat> But excuse me. But uh, this upward revision from previous outlook comes mainly from a package effect, uh, especially private investment, public consumption, and uh, investment. As pandemic related support is fully phased out in 2024, government spending decline and business investment normalize. Then domestic demand growth will be moderate in 2024. We also assume that monetary policy continue to be accommodative. When inflation and wage growth meet banks, Bank of Japan's criteria at the end of 2024, the year's curve control will start to be eased by allowing steeper slope without changing the short-term rate. Uh, there, are some, there are some uh downside and upside risks. The high inf higher inflation will damage private activities. Weak external demand and supply chain disruption affect negative on export production and also private investment. On the other hand, strong, stronger external demand, including uh, inbound tourism, will push up economic growth. Uh, this is a summary of Japan's outlook. So, as I said, uh, if it continues tightening and unemployment rate will decrease continuously. And so, yes, inflation rate is, is, is moderated in 2023, but uh, gaining uh, momentum uh, as the wage growth continued in 2024. Then finally, so gro uh, gross domestic 
uh, demand, uh, uh, GDP growth rate will uh, push up uh, 2023, uh, mainly by the economic policy package effect, but decrease uh, as it uh, become normalized. So the Japanese government reacted to various shocks swiftly and strongly, but at the same time, the government has been piled up. Even before COVID-19, Japan's gross debt to GDP ratio is the highest among OECD countries, including large-scale policy package uh, with assumption that uh, uh, the non-target price subsidy will continue, then the GDP debt to GDP ratio will reach unprecedented level. Finally, I would like to mention our recommendations, lots of <laughs> recommendations uh, here. So at first, uh, accelerating structural reform will be critical to boost productivity and wages. Further fiscal measures to support households and businesses should be temporary and more targeted. Prolonged uh, price cap will damage fiscal sustainability and could reduce incentives to shift to renewable and lower energy demand by distorting market signals. Securing and reallocation employment, global supply chains and energy sources are higher priority, both in the short and longer term. Continue to work style reform, expanding social security coverage for non-standard non workers and enhancing vocational training and education could boost labor productivity and also supply. Uh, lowering barriers to foreign workers and foreign direct investment would also helpful. And uh, the progress with data and green transformation is uh, specially needed. This will be supported by the new economic policy package, as I mentioned. However, high, higher permanent, uh, permanent government expenditure without additional revenue will worsen the fiscal sustainability and strengthen the sustainable growth. So we, uh, uh, we recommend that, that it, it is very important to either set out a clear roadmap to achieve the fiscal consolidation uh, cons consolidation target by fiscal year 2025, or reconsider the earlier plan and then define a new credible target underpinned by a specific set of measures. It is also important that uh, resuming a fiscal consolidation effort on both an expenditure and revenue side as a recovery strengthen. At last, uh, as further rapid changes in economic condition might trigger a uh, revision to the monetary policy framework, as I uh, as uh, I mentioned, then uh, the Bank of Japan should uh, continue to communicate currently and uh, future market stance clearly and in a timely manner. So that's all from uh, our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Makawa and Mr. Oguro, for your uh, very clear and uh, insightful and impactful uh, presentations. Uh, Dr. McGowan explained that the uh, current energy crisis and, uh, policy, uh, and policy measures uh, that we should take. And uh, uh, it was especially uh, interesting uh, that uh, she mentioned energy and supply chain, uh, interest rate, and food as important uh, variables. Uh, and I was uh, surprised that uh, OECD countries' inflation projection uh, is over uh, 9%, and uh, it might result in the further depreci depreciation of the yen in the future. Uh, she also pointed out the, uh, the importance of ensuring the free trade system, promoting the uh, women's uh, labor participation, and investing in skills, especially for young generations. Mr. Uguro explained the, the current situation and the uh, current challenges in Japan uh, and touched on the uh, importance of the government efforts uh, to increase uh, productivity and wages and fiscal reform. Uh, it, was, it will be very tough uh, now. So uh, we would like to move on to the uh, session. Um, I'd like to uh, pick up the first question. Uh, yes. Uh, this one. Uh, slide seven uh, shows that uh, uh, global economic growth rate for 2023 has been revised uh, downward to 2.2% from the previous outlook in June of 2.6%, uh, which uh, deviates considerably from the 2.7 uh, uh, forecast for uh, 2023 in, in the IMF's World Economic Outlook which was released last month, yes, uh, last month. 
Uh, how do you explain uh, this difference? Uh, may I ask you the, uh, this question, uh, Dr. Makawa? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I'm not, I, I don't know the exact assumptions of the IMF forecast, but I think we are living in a very uncertain time, like uncertainty risks are very high. And to me, these kind of differences in growth for projections uh, is uh, expected uh, in these times. So um, even even one a month, even a few weeks of uh, difference in projections can make a difference. I think from the last week that we have published our forecast, like oil prices have are, have changed, exchange rates have changed, so uh, these can have uh, very large effects. And um, probably, and and for example, inflation has been surprising on the upside for a, a, such a long time. We have been under projection in projecting inflation. So uh, what we might have forecast, what the IMF forecast last month might be different what, from what we have this time. Also, an important uh, factor in this crisis is that during the pandemic, uh, households and firms have increased their savings. So the assumptions about the extent to which households and firms are using their savings in this uncertain times makes a big difference, I think, uh, in terms of growth projections. That's me. I don't know if Kay has anything to add, but thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Uguro-san, uh, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, the, uh, the, uh, as Muge said, the, the, the situation is changing uh, voluntarily. So, the, yes, even in, from our September outlook, so we, uh, we change a lot of uh, uh, economic uh, assumption. Also, that uh, as as we say, as as we see that uh, only in the Japanese uh, yen depreciation. So now, J Japanese yen is going back uh, again higher. So the situation is very uh, uh, volatile. So uh, the, so the, this is uh, the main factor of the, the projection is different. So okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, I'd like to move on the uh, next questions. Yes, uh, slide two shows the uh, world is coping with a large energy uh, price shock. Yes, in Japan. Um, uh, in Japan, uh, sorry, in Japan, uh, energy prices are soaring, but uh, we uh, do not feel it as seriously as they were before the Lima shock in uh, 28. Uh, can we assume that Japan is doing well uh, with its, its this energy crisis? Yes, uh, I think this uh, question uh, go to the uh, Oguro-san. May I ask uh, your answer? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your question. So the situation is uh, totally different from the country by country. And uh, also a uh, very important part is dependency of the energy on the Russia. So Japan rely uh, energy on heavily rely on the Middle East. And also the Japanese uh, energy contraction uh, contract is uh, based on the long term, long term fixed uh, contract. So this uh, works well um, for the uh, relatively uh, unchanged uh, energy price. And of course, Japanese government uh, doing very well about the uh, suppressed the energy price hike. So Japanese government have uh, uh, oil price cap, then th th this works very well. But uh, this is the half is uh, the, it's true, Japan doing well, but also the, the it is uh, kind of a, uh, the, the risk is also high also in Japan. So what will happen and in under the uh, higher uh, geopolitical risk or supply chain disruption? So this will happen also in Japan. So uh, I think it, uh, it is also important for Japan uh, to uh, diversify energy resource and also uh, prepare for the further shock uh, for the uh, further. Uh, yes, so that's. Uh, from my answer. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Uro. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, pick up two questions uh, simultaneously. Uh, okay, the, uh, as slide 26 shows, uh, Japan's government debt is uh, in a critical situation. Are there any OECD countries that have successfully overcome this kind of the debt crisis? And uh, uh, one more question. In the 1990s, Japan like, ranked third in GDP per capita uh, behind Luxembourg and Switzerland, but now it ranks 22nd in the world and is middle ranking uh, country in the OECD. What do you think is uh, lacking in Japan? Maybe so that uh, this is a question for the OECD Japan desk <laughs> as a total. So the, uh, how Japan can survive this situation and how we can uh, recover the status, uh, international status. Uh, yep. And how, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, may I ask the, uh, the Dr. Makuon first? Yes, thank you. Thank you for this hard but good question. <laughs> um, so in terms of um, the debt, so what's, what we, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think the numbers for Japan are quite higher in, uh, related to past experiences, but I think uh, a number of European countries in the late 90s and early 2000s managed to bring their uh, public debt down. So um, this, they did through several channels. So one was, of course, fiscal consolidation. So primary balance surpluses were needed. Uh, they were helped by real interest rates. They were helped by real GDP growth. So I think uh, in this today's environment, um, uh, there will be a need for the first, first channel that there will be a need for uh, primary balance sur surpluses. So if you look at past OECD experiences, I think the, the one lesson is that generally expenditure-based uh, consolidations are more durable and more growth friendly. So expenditures reforms bring down government consumption. Uh, they have reformed, for example, in Belgium in late 90s, they really transferred their, uh, they really reformed their household transfer system so that it became more efficient. So Finland, Ireland, I think the Netherlands uh, also had similar uh, reforms that helped them bring down um, bring down debt. As as uh, Kay's last slide showed, this is an advice that we give to many OECD countries because after the pandemic, their debt has increased. That they have to have a medium term plan, so that we need some uh, certainty and some good plans some maybe expenditure rules uh, might be needed to contain uh, spending, increase spending efficiency. Um, there is not an easy solution, but I think these are what we have learned from uh, past times. Uh, maybe I pass on to Kay for the last yes. question <laughs> since it's so hard. But I, I mean, I think this is the, the what, how, what can Japan do? That's what we try to uh, explain uh, from, our, from our surveys. And we're about to start the 2023 Japan survey preparations. So um, I think this will be uh, one of the main questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Okura. Uh, you already mentioned that about uh, Japanese policy uh, recommendation, but uh, would you add something? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so this is very, uh, <laughs> Uh, big question and also but uh, uh, we already know about the question so uh, even in uh, 20 or even in 30 years ago uh, we recognized the uh, Japanese uh, uh, serious situation and also the uh, very big challenge against the future uh, population declining and also the future sus uh, fiscal sustainability so Japan uh, already know about what will happen in future and in addition to that, the COVID-19 and also the uh, so this kind of energy crisis happens. But uh, it's uh, not new, actually. Uh, in terms of uh, the economic policy, uh, the, uh, I think that uh, the, uh, 
especially investment uh, is very limited in this uh, uh, decade. So, so now, so it, of course it, it is for in investment in tangible and also intangible assets, including human capital resources. So, so Japan is now uh, recognized again uh, under this uh, hard situation. And so uh, it is a good timing to change uh, the, our uh, how to say, deflationary mindset. And also the, it's good time to change the, the more uh, agile uh, and also more flexible uh, policy framework. And also the, it is important for the private activity. And so when we think about the, uh, uh, economic policy. Uh, so it uh, recently Japan only talk about expenditure size. So uh, more expenditure, more boost, but uh, uh, decrease the, uh, uh, how say it, uh, some uh, fixed cost. But uh, it is also important to discuss about revenue side. And so uh, I, I, so in European country, countries and also United States recently discussed about the new framework for uh, more investment in green uh, climate change and also the uh, fight with the uh, inflation. Then they also uh, discuss about the revenue so from the how say uh, windfall tax or. Uh, 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 re uh, tax revenue from the highly uh, profitable com company. So it is both important to discuss on not only the one side, but so uh, consider the various uh, policy mix. Then, and also we uh, think about the, the mitigate the vulnerable uh, household and uh, companies. So it's also also the, the kind of combination of every policy. So uh, so it's not timing to uh, discuss uh, more about the uh, uh, revenue side and also uh, various policy mix to ha have a sustainable growth. Thank you very much, Mr. Oguro, uh, for your uh, excellent uh, comments. And uh, uh, Dr. McCowell, uh, thank you very much. And uh, yes, uh, I think that it's a big challenge. It's time to uh, change our uh, situation and uh, mindset and uh, invest for the invest on the new uh, industry and uh, of course the young generation and uh, our women as well. And uh, uh, actually the uh, Rieti uh, launched a new uh, EBPM uh, center. It's a uh, uh, evidence-based policy making center. So the, uh, by learning from the European countries uh, experiences uh, uh, in 20s and uh, uh, or the uh, early uh, until 20s uh, or the 2010s. Uh, but uh, uh, we'd like to uh, use the evidence the what kind of policy is effective and what kind of policy is uh, not if, uh, effective. So uh, uh, by using such kind of uh, new uh, policy tools, uh, of course, uh, we should use uh, digital. Uh, uh, this government uh, to the, uh, the monitor or the uh, check the uh, our uh, performances, but uh, uh, our EBP center uh, will, uh, I think, I hope that contribute to the uh, new uh, Japan's uh, policy making. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent, uh, fabulous uh, presentation and uh, uh, contribution. Uh, again, I'd like to thank the, uh, Dr. Makugawa and uh, Mr. Uguro and Ms. Ueda for today's uh, participation. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>